cry. Remember your facial expressions, Emily. Let's do that again. Cry. Keep it there. Keep it there. Well done. We're going to do look. Right. Look at me. Remember, you're telling someone to look at you. So look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Turn to the side. Look at me. Again. Look at me. Look at me. Keep it there. Put your fingers up to your eyes. That's right. That's a good girl. Relax your hand now. And now you're going to look at somebody else. So you're taking your view out. Right, up by your eyes, Emily. And bring your fingers out a little bit, just a little bit. And look. Facial expressions. Let's do that one again. You dropped a hand. Try and keep your hands up the same. Keep your fingers, fingers straight, fingers straight. Go up by your eyes, Emily, a little bit more. And come out a little bit, just a little bit. That's it, that's it, hold that there. Hold it there. Keep looking. Well done. Relax your hands now. Give your hands a bit of a shake. Now, sad. And remember your facial expressions. Put your thumb in. Look at my hand. Look at my hand. Put your thumb in. Fingers straight and down. Sad. Slowly, slowly. Keep it there. Stay with it. Grand. That's it. Put your hands down. Relax your arms now. Give your arms a bit of a shake. Is that okay? Okay, give your shoulders a bit of a shake. Right. Whoa. Bit of a head roll there. There you go. And there. And down to the front. Well done. Up again. You've concentrated. Can you do that sign? Can you do the sign for concentrate? Concentrate. Don't bring your hands out too much. Do that again. Just a little bit. Up a bit. Put your hands up a bit. And go. Concentrate. Just like in school. Concentrate. That's it. You have to concentrate. Well done, Emily. Well done. Let's give your arms a bit of a rest now. Is that okay? Well done, Emily. Thank you, Emily. Wow. Remember your facial expressions, Emily. Let's do that again. Okay. Um, just to, I want to say something about the copy that we're showing you here. Danica didn't have time to, because she was pre preparing for um, Sao Paulo, to send me um, the 
the real projection. So she, I, I had the pr preview and I have permission to show you the preview. But also, she normally only shows her videos in a very particular soundscape, so with surround sound and, and Dolby sound, so that, um, that it was really nice of her to agree to be, have it shown in this, ver this way. But what, what, what you have to consider when you think about it is that actually the sound comes more from the back normally just to, um, and we'll see it again after Lena's um, performance. Emily, or on education. They sound like commands, never mind that the voice of the woman uttering them is soft and, with its northern dialect, slightly endearing. Cry, look at me. Concentrate, remember, relax your hands now. And then, that's a good girl. And well done, Emily, well done. Her voice is the only one we hear in the video. It is exclusive. The woman's voice spreads over the surface of the image, an image that shows one thing and one thing only the face of a young girl in close-up, reacting to, no, corresponding with the woman's voice. When God said, let there be light, there was light. And when the woman says, concentrate, the girl concentrates. The girl does as the woman commands, but she does not cry. Why doesn't she cry? Because we err when we perceive the woman woman's utterances to be commands. Most of them are in fact something else. They are words. When commands do enter the woman's speech, they are subtle, sublimated to a teacher-pupil setting, which in many ways is sublimation itself. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with her, and the word was her. Then she spoke. She speaks and she delivers the words, the gospel, to her pupil. Cry, she says. And though we do not see her, as she is only voice, and thus her voice resounds all the more powerful, we understand that she is giving these words to the girl. Cry, she says. And she bestows the words upon the girl, who takes it up, avails herself of it, and exercises it. The word is sounded, no, signed, utilized, stretched, not quite consumed. This is the setting. This is the story. There is no story beyond the setting. Obviously, the video must start somewhere and equally come to an end, thereby creating a narrative by default since it all since at its structural core. This is all a narrative consists of the point A and B and something that moves from one to the other. Point A and B are marked by beginning and end titles. They are thus delinea delineated from the abyss, abyss of non-meaning by the ultimate cause of being, that is the artist. Yet within these extrinsic boundaries, little developments can be detected. Somewhere, the story sets in. Cry, says the woman. She might very, she might very well have said, concentrate. The ending is a different matter, for sure. The coach has finished her instructions. Thank you, Emily. Thus dismissed, the girl leaves the frame. Emptiness prevails just long enough for us to realize that this is over. The end of the story and video coincide. But we are forced to perceive this concurrence as mere convenience. It owes to the fact that the material is culled from a real life event. This is no documentary though, just a situation where reality is leaned on. In what I would like to call a lucky accident, accident, the opportunity for a narrative end presents itself. 
and the artist sees her chance. If there is no story beyond the setting, no narrative development, development beyond the end, and if beginning and end add up to an arbitrary slice of life, can it be said that there is form? Is the artist reigning supreme upon her material, declaring it art in a capricious or autocratic or conceptual act? Yes and no. Yes, there is form. And no, this is made art not by definition, but through the aesthetics of perception. Moreover, in this video, from form follows perception. And it is through perception that the artist introduces the viewers to the work. In fact, she places the viewers smack dab in the middle of it. Let's think about duration for a moment. How long is a moment? If the length of the video is not determined determined by narrative, one might say the video starts four and a half minutes before its end, nor by a random gesture. What has governed the decision for this and not another time spin? Why does the plot start at cry and not concentrate? An answer. Four and a half minutes is the time we need to look, to hear, to understand, and to wonder. First and foremost, we wonder about the girl, about that which we are given to see. The obvious fact, facts are established quickly. First, we comprehend that she is signing. Then, we discover her hearing aids. We grasp that she is being taught, though it remains unclear, at least to those of us who have no knowledge of sign language, whether she is learning whether she's learning basics or subtleties? Is every deaf child taught this way? Or could it be that she's acquiring a special skill? The camera is close, very close, cropping the face even, allowing us a discomforting intimacy. We might believe our unease to be stemming from the fact that the face is transfixed by the framing. Is the camera illicitly intruding upon the child? Are we treading where no adult should go? Yet it is we who are pinned in place, in a position simultaneous voyeurism. Our chagrin is not caused by conscience, nor by respect towards another being. It springs from a lack of control over our own gaze. This lack stands in stark contrast to voyeuristic pleasure, because the latter hinges upon the fantasy of free will and intentionality. We have four and a half minutes, enough time to become aware of our own drive to register, process, uh, register, process, analyze. Not enough time for closure. The unease abates slightly once we realize that the girl is quite intentional and active in what she is doing. Her blank face had originally fooled us. This isn't the first time that the absence of psyche and physiognomy has been mistaken in, for purity and vulner, vulnerability. We do this to children time and again, zoom in on their putative and putative innocence. In fact, there is a want of echoes in this face a trace that might be read as expressions of an individual. And this, and this creates a conflict, since it is express, expressiveness that this face is asked to convey. Signing, more than other forms of speaking, demands a strong use of mimicry. Sad, cues the woman's voice. And though we do not see her, this unseen source of language and meaning, we see her in the girl, <clears throat> for the girl is her mirror. The woman is obviously feeding her morsels of knowledge by enunciation and by gesture. The girl takes all in and regurgitates simultaneously. Observation, imitation. In this, she is fully focused, indeed. Indeed, her concentration astonishes. 
a trace, trace, a, a trance. She shares with us no sense of awareness of the camera, despite the fact that she is almost looking directly at it. Towards the end, the spell is broken. Her eyes slip away as if need of another object in, of interest. It is those moments when we see herself break her role that herself steals in her face fleetingly. The girl applies herself to the task at hand with de determination. Obviously, she is a willing subject to subjection and does not need Louis Althusser to understand the element of repression in language and subjecthood. Pupil and teacher seem complicit with each other in this act. Are they complicit with the camera, the artist eye? I can find no evidence of such uh, such a collusion. To the contrary, I would suggest that it is in vain all speculations upon frame of mind of those cast in their roles by the camera. The psychological the Psychology we perceive is a trick, an effect of the medium, and of our desire too. We are imprinting upon the face, upon what we see, as the voice of the woman might be imprinting upon the girl, for all we know, according to our prior experience of a particular human relation called Erziehung, education or upbringing. Youth and adult subject formation and pedagogy, compliance and command. It is an ancient pairing, predating this story, predating us. Yet the video leads us, willing subjects, into the trap of psyche and reflection. It does so with the tools of its trade, a counterposition of image and sound, the image is quite flat, but its cropping puts its ripe up to us. It is felt almost viscerally. Intruding upon our personal space, it fixes in a proximity and holds us there. Rejection of the visual experience would be the only possible route of escape. Shut my eyes, leave the room. I don't want to see an another arty farty video. Let's assume rejection is out of the question. That leaves us in a stranglehold, in the face of the girl. How far away are we? Close. No, even closer. The woman's voice must be coming from behind us. It is only logical. What we would expect sitting that close facing the girl. Her voice, the woman's voice, never ceases. ceases. It is not loud, but its timbre carries, carries far. Despite all this intimacy, we must be sitting in a large room. A private scene in public setting? No matter. In any case, there is something off with this, com with this situation. This soft, friendly voice, larger than life, extending its reach in space and time, is Omnipotent, omnipotent in another way. Where it rains, all other sounds has been su suspended. No shuffling of feet, no sniffing of nose, of the nose, no scratching of the hair. The, earl, the girl's eyes blink rapidly in silence. If it is the voice that makes the space, and in her three-dimensionality determines place, then it is she that truly casts us in the scene. It is she who encourages us to take the face of the girl, not as an image, but for real. Simple logic, isn't it? The space is there, and we are in it, together with the voice. The voice mirrored in the girl's face, and vice versa, we presume, and so it must exist despite its flatness. We see, we hear, ergo we exist. Pardon, did I not mean ergo it exists? 
This is what the video shows us, the confusion, which is no confusion at all. It ensures in the coalition of actual sensory perception with our concept of perception. This is what we know, that bodily boundaries are, are whimsicals, that our belief in bodily and mental autonomy is just that, a belief. But we don't want to know this. We do not want to know that our subjectivity is an effect of a fantastic, a phantasmatic effort, that it is contingent that it is contingent, dependent on a laborious process of construction, one in which our own psyche coalesces in complicity with others. Propelled in this, into the scene, unsure of our footing, present but without place, we are made to realize, not just in theory, but rather quite practically, that our existence is rooted in ability to forge connections with others. We might be looking directly at the girl's face, as if looking at our mirror image. But she knows what we seem to have forgotten, that in order to come be into being, one must first and foremost reach someone else and be reached in turn. So the teacher and pupil mirror each other in their attempt of communication. So the camera joins them in their game, so we too are included in their complicity. The artist acknowledges her part in this complicity by highlighting the girl's name, Emily, a person, a subject. Nonetheless, complicity is a far cry from symbiosis. Despite the mirage of unity, the simultaneity of utterances, the incessant drive for identification on a multiplicity of levels, we can all fall apart. What holds us together is the recognition that this word of work of concentration must be done, that it is not centered on us, though we are in its center, the blind spot, the eye of the hurricane. We are but a medium of the artist. Nevertheless, this experience will make an imprint upon us, change us, help us be. The consequence of having been put in the unease in between position is ethics. Maybe, maybe, if we manage to think away from ourselves and towards connecting with others, we can take pleasure in this dissolution of the antithesis between concentration and dispersal. For really, what is concentration but a dispersal for the ego? And how else would we come into existence if not through the shared experience of becoming the, and becoming undone? In, deliberate, in deliberately situating us in her work without giving us the means for representation, Danica Dukic has acknowledged acknowledged her, uh, blind spot, that blind spot exists. But if in the center of meaning making there can be found an instance that cannot be represented, moreover, if we find ourselves in that exact location, then who is making the meaning? It follows that there is no voice of God, nor autocratic authorship. Any meaning worth its salt that is, any work that matters to the viewers, must take a risk. The risk of being shattered from the inside. In this, subjects are not so different from artworks. Cry. Remember your facial expressions, Emily. Let's do that again. Cry. Keep it there. Keep it there. Well done. We're going to do look. Right. 
look at me. Remember, you're telling someone to look at you. So look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Turn to the side. Look at me. Again. Look at me. Look at me. Keep it there. Put your fingers up to your eyes. That's right. That's a good girl. Relax your hand now. And now you're going to look at somebody else. So you're taking your view out. Right, up by your eyes, Emily. And bring your fingers out a little bit, just a little bit. And look. Facial expressions. Let's do that one again. You dropped a hand. Try and keep your hands up the same. Keep your fingers, fingers straight, fingers straight. Go up by your eyes, Emily, a little bit more. And come out a little bit, just a little bit. That's it, that's it, hold that there. Hold it there. Keep looking. Well done. Relax your hands now. Give your hands a bit of a shake. Now, sad. Now remember your facial expressions. Put your thumb in. Look at my hand. Look at my hand. Put your thumb in. Fingers straight and down. Sad. Slowly, slowly. Keep it there. Stay with it. Grand. That's it. Put your hand down. Relax your arms now. Give your arms a bit of a shake. Is that okay? Okay, give your shoulders a bit of a shake. Right. Whoa. Bit of a head roll there. There you go. And there. And down to the front. Well done. Up again. You've concentrated. Can you do that sign? Can you do the sign for concentrate? Concentrate. Don't bring your hands out too much. Do that again. Just a little bit. Up a bit. Put your hands up a bit. And go. Concentrate. Just like in school. Concentrate. That's it. You have to concentrate. Well done, Emily. Well done. Let's give your arms a bit of a rest now. Is that okay? Well done, Emily. Thank you, Emily. Cry. Are we going to get another version of the text as we received a second viewing of the film? Have we also heard? I'm just asking if the text will be repeated the way the film has just been repeated. One more time. Is Louder. Is the text? Wait. Will wait <laughs> until he's gone because it's it's yeah. Will the text be repeated the way the video has been repeated? 
No, but I think I will give the text to um, um, uh, to Gabrielle, and she can put it on the website or somewhere, publish it. Yeah. And uh, why? Why do you want to have the text repeated, or don't you want to have the text repeated? What's the question about? I'm wondering, actually. I mean, I have some question to Lena, and I have question to Lena that I address to you. Um, but first, perhaps, I've even a question before that, which is the film, the video essay, um, that kind of ended abruptly um, before the first viewing of Emily. It's a film by May. Is the film actually finished, or does it just... I had the feeling it was going somewhere else, and perhaps it's just me, but my appetite kind of got quite big, and then it just stopped and we went straight into Emily. I was just wondering if that was actually planned plan like this, if the film is actually only 28 minutes long or something, or, or, if, that's, or, if, or if it was a technical um, issue. No, the, um, the film is actually finished. It was a, um, it's not a film that stands on its own, at least so far not, because May made it for this conference. So she made it for us. Um, I invited her to come and speak here, but she can't because she just had a child. Um, it's really very, very f young, fresh, the child. And um, so she couldn't travel with it. It doesn't even have a passport yet. And, um, and um, also, I'm assuming she also didn't want to travel with the child. But um, so she said she wanted to try out this format of the video essay. Um, so she's not, she's a researcher, she's not an artist. Um, and um, the, the reason your appetite has been whetted, I think, is probably also because this comes from a wealth of research that she's been doing for years and years. So she knows so much more than what she has now shown us. And she's just given us a, a piece of that, what she knows. And it's very original research. No one else has this material. I guess I just wanted to see some extract of the sound of music after having got repeated. <laughs> I just got like but one, you already one got woman, sing seven kids, and nine nuns. So I just, you know, felt, oh, it will perhaps come. <laughs> you already got singing in the rain. <laughs> True. <laughs> I have a question to Lina, actually. Did you um, rehearse this reading? Yes, I did. But. Um, yeah, I read it um, sometime, Yeah, I read it three times more or less for my mother and in front of your mother. Yes, and that was it. <laughs> yeah. So, did you actually receive um, comments or feedback how to read this text from your mother? Um, uh, I. Yes, about the pronunciation of some words and, um, yeah, some accents. I don't know, yeah, not, yeah, some, but not really much. <laughs> Have you read Lou Yaltuza? Um, I just um, made a um, note in my text and then I, next time I did it better. <laughs> it was not like an... I was really, yeah, I, I, actually I liked it because I could, um, yeah, I, I like to do things better than What did you think of the text? Um, or did you think first, of the text? Yes, at first um, I thought it was quite um, difficult to understand, so I um, just read it out loud and not really thinking about its meaning. But then um, yesterday I really started looking at and reading really concentrated and thinking about what it mean, meant. and. Um, I could understand quite well for and um, but it helped also to see the the film and yes, then everything falls into place also. 
But do you think we need the text in order to see the film? Um, yeah, I no no. I first I read the text, so but I was waiting to see the film. Yes, I was. Yeah, I needed to see the film to understand it better. And could you identify it with Emily, in a way? Um, not really, because I'm not deaf or <laughs> something. But um, I, yeah, I could, in the film I saw that she was first fully concentrated, but not the yeah, and 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 it went away, and I can identify with it. <laughs> But, yeah, not in other ways, not really. Yes, I just wanted to make a comment on something that for me linked the two works, May's work and, um, and Danitza's. Um, if we say, speak up, or you have a voice, um, do you only have one voice? Like you only have one woe vote, like Ruth said in her introduction? Um, or do we have many voices? And um, the question of, do we need an agent to produce art? Or can it be many agents? Or can it be a ritual? I think it's still, in a lot of people's minds, it cannot be a ritual. Ritual is not an artistic practice. It's a communal society practice. And it's because there's a diversity of voices in a ritual and voices not belonging to the body where you expect them. And I think that was a very interesting link between the dispersion, concentration, and the ego between the two and also between some comments or questions that Simon asked me about the voiceover. Like, do I need to put my own voice? Which one? Yeah, I'd, um, Lina, I'd like to ask you the same thing I asked Natasha. You know, where yourself, where are you when you are speaking this text? Do you think about that? I mean, is the text somehow making you vanish, or is it making you appear? Um. <laughs> I think it. I'm not really, yeah, I'm actually not really, yeah, I'm trying to bring it over, but not really from myself, because it's not the text I wrote, but, um, yeah, I can't really do it from myself, like Lina, <laughs> because I wouldn't use this kind of words, because I'm not <laughs> that good in English. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, yeah. But yeah. Maybe it ties back to to you know the the kind of performative um, yes. differently from the performance performative as we think of it in the arts world, but more of the performative of theater or music, and that even connects back to Wendelin's film yesterday with this role, and to May's um, Woman in the Shadow, the one who's speaking the voice in this, you know, as a medium. Yeah, so, so that uh, maybe a difference between the performance within the arts world is that it's very much centered on this artist authorial voice, whereas the performative you now presented us, yes. and also Natasha presented us, the, this person who's interpreting is important, but is also a versionist in this way of getting a meaning, allowing a meaning come to life. Yes. For me, it was a big pleasure to hear th this um, text through another person and not to have it attached to the author subject. Yes. Yeah, I can imagine this <laughs> because yeah, then you hear it from another angle, or you, yeah, you interpret it from another angle. I, yeah. I think Ruth uh, was speaking before also about the power of artworks. Sorry. Oh, sorry, I didn't. The space was too big. Sorry. 
working. <laughs> oh, it is. I have a question for Ruth, actually. Um, and because the subtitle of today is Subjectivity and Subjection. And I remember taking a writing class one day and we had to write a story from the perspective of a seven-year-old. And it was that my teacher was very adamant about having to use words that suit the vocabulary of a seven-year-old. And coming to the subjection part of the uh, performance, which is Lena reading your text, um, and you can see, or maybe I'm just interpreting for you, Lina, um, that it's not your vocabulary, it's not your speech, it's not your, um, you don't own it. No, huh? yes. And um, if you look at, for instance, to psychoanalysis and uh, you read on the, the traumatic act of having to step up into someone's shoes or in someone's speech, actually, it's not yours, it's always combined with stress. It can be experienced as quite traumatic, actually. Um, so I wondered, Ruth, um, what was your motivation to ask someone to step in your shoes? I will um, answer that, but I would first like to to give voice, to give room for, for this, and then I will return to it. Unless you think I should first answer. I think you should first answer, because okay. it would bring things okay. again in a different way. Well, um, I, some of the reasons I did this, I asked Lina to read this text, was, were not rational. They have to do with, um, you know, with playfulness, but also with, with trying to tie different strings of the whole day together, so that I, you know, there's certain motifs that need to recur. Yeah, and one of the motifs is, is you know, uh, um, the, the child or the, the person who's not adult speaking and I was very much inspired by by um, a psychoanalyst called Adam Phillips from England who's um, a bit of some people don't take him very serious because it's not it's very theoretical but it's neither psychoanalytical theory as it's written by psychoanalysts nor is it theory as it's psychoanalytic theory that as it's perceived by people from cultural studies or so so um but i really get inspired by him and he wrote this text where um where he's actually trying to show that it's a complete fiction that there's a border between adults and children because from a psychoanalytic point of view children are um already um the adults to be developed and from a and adults are children in that all the formative aspects of their life have happened in childhood so he tries to 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 take that boundary away so one of the things i was interested in was actually you know crossing that boundary and finding different ways of crossing that boundary um but the other thing i was interested in is um even though Lena doesn't own the words, I think that when Lena speaks the words, they're actually more understandable to spectators than when I speak them. Because what happens is, because I wrote those words, is that I inhabit these words as if it, the meaning is already clear and the understanding is already clear. Because I, you know how you get too close to your text and then because you wrote it and then you don't have a distance to it anymore. And then when you're trying to um, speak it, you're, you're already s assuming that this act of comprehending, of receiving the words has, and, and understanding them has been done. It's not a conscious thing, but it's somehow, and it, it makes you speak and pronounce when you're lecturing in such a way that um, the audience is just, you know, swishing over you. It's just another academic text. And you don't understand anything. And I've had this often happen to me, that I'm sitting in a lecture, and I think, oh, this might be interesting, but I just, I can't grasp it. Yeah, I can't. And even though I think I, I don't write completely academically, I still know that this can happen. And I was very much interested in finding out whether there are different ways of, of speaking a text so that this doesn't happen. 
And this is also what connects it back to May, because May is speaking, and I didn't see this beforehand, and I didn't know that she wasn't going to pose in front of the camera. So we just have a voice, and I was thinking, what's the difference between her now lecturing us from yesterday, someone lecturing us? Is this the same? Is this as difficult to understand it was, as it was yesterday? Um, or is it... Um, is it easier to understand, you know, what, this is what I mean when I'm saying, you know, you have to look at the medium of transportation of this. It's not just about the meaning and it's not just about the origin of this voice. So I would be also very interested in hearing from you whether you grasp some of what Lena was saying or was, whether it was, um, yeah, whether you were listening to her voicing or whether you started getting into it like you did with Natasha, you know, started getting into the content. I would be very interested in that. Yes, I, I did notice that I would understand the lecture of uh, Lina much better than I, I would follow them yesterday, for example, because these people were reading their own texts, and um, it did make a big difference, I agree. It worked. Yeah. Because I could follow, in, and by here, listening to her voice, um, would follow also her um, discovery through the text. Yeah. I would like, oh, can I just ask in between, because there will be more comments probably, because the, the motivation of Ruth was asked why you asked Lina, and I would like to ask Lina, why did you take it on and did you like it? Um, I like to do new things, so well, I, because I never lectured for some for people, <laughs> not not in this way, but I so I wanted to experience it, and um, I I like yeah, and I really liked it, <laughs> and and I thought it would maybe also help me because I sing in a choir and um, I love to sing, but I'm always a bit nervous to sing alone, so I thought maybe it would also help. It, with that, yeah. And do you think it does? I think so. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> uh, for me, just to describe sort of how I experienced your lecture, uh, at first I found myself thinking about the content of the words more to follow the train of thought, uh, but then I started more think if more relating to you speaking and, and I found that you had a really strong sense of wanting to do a good job and having worked hard and I started to uh, see how present you were like that uh, and I, I, eventually I started to identify with you I started to kind of see aspects in your personality that I V wish to value about myself, so I started kind of identifying as well with you. So, so that was my own experience of how I connected to the various rhythms. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, for me, it was sometimes quite hard to go back to the content of your text because I was um, a lot busy with uh, thinking about the, the pronunciation, which I sometimes found hard to understand because maybe it was not completely right. I mean, I'm also not English mother tongue, so it can happen to me as well, but it was quite a hard text. So I found it a bit disturbing. Um, but I could really um, f feel when you understood the text so in this part, you got me, and I, I could understand what you were talking about. But at the same time, when you didn't get what you were, what what you what you was reading, I also lost it, and I was just busy with listening to the mistakes. So I think the most important is that you understand what you're reading, and then you can get the people also.
Oh, hello, Lina. Um, so, so I wanted to ask a question. Uh, how did you how did you feel about being asked asked doing it? First, I think uh, I'm happy that you liked it because I don't understand a word. Sorry. <laughs> so I'm happy that you liked it, but I was wondering how did you feel uh, being asked to to make this reading? Did you feel honored because because you because Ruth would give you importance? Did you feel maybe also being the tool of a uh, the tool of an author, so of an authority, maybe that then you would just be reading like someone else's text, just more for what you are, more than who you are. And but I have to add that when I saw you reading, so I get the content a bit less because I was really focusing on you. I was really into you and thinking, ah, like I was happy when I could see that that you were reading better. So I don't know if this was Ruth's intention, but if it was, that also means that she gave up a little, a little bit of her text and gave you some importance. But well, I just Lina doesn't need me to give her importance. <laughs> well, at least what did you feel? Um, I, did, I didn't really think about that actually, but I, I, um, I felt I, at first, I didn't really know why she asked me, but um, I felt, yeah, quite honored, and I, yeah, I was, yeah, I was quite honored, <laughs> but not like that. I, I, w I was thinking that I needed someone to help me or something, to help, yeah. Mm, I, yeah. You know how in the beginning of the, um, this session I showed you this um, Hollywood separation and this questioning of the attachment of the body to the voice and, and this critical aspect about that and then it's clasped back together and we're now doing the same thing. I don't know if you're noticing that that's what we're doing. In the way we're actually um, interrogating Lena, you know, she's speaking suddenly authentically about her. And then, um, and no one's criticizing that I gave her the text. I think it's highly problematic. <laughs> you did? You did. She, someone did, but uh, no, not very, not, not very, you were still very polite. <laughs> I expected some people to say this is abuse of power. Uh. And, but also, <laughs> yeah. No. No, I think it's it's uh, it, it's it's for me. I feel the same. I think as Lena, we both you know we want to experience what this does, and and this also has to do with my in interest in doing rather than just representing something. You know, just you know making this. So I'm actually I I find this very helpful. What you're you know what what is being said. Um, but I was also reminded of an anecdote um, that someone told me just a week ago um, of a conference um, where before the start of the first lecture, um, the organizers got up and they said um, that, um, that an actor had been invited to deliver a lecture and it wasn't going to be said who of the lecturers was the actor, but this was not a doc, um, an academic. All the others, it was a, a, an academic a conference. And um, the effect, and, and that the audience was asked to find out who was the fake. <laughs> and this prompted the audience not to take serious a single of the lecturers. <laughs> there was laugh the whole time, and of course, None of them were actors. <laughs> yeah. So I'm also interested in this, you know, what happens when we ch start to question these frameworks. 
that you know how we usually perform in you know on stage, how we perform the artist, how we perform the academic, how we perform our disciplines. Yes, and I would also like to comment on how we link perfection and perfection to psychological state. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a question of frame, and the frame we have here is that her interpretation of Ruth's text gives, gives transparency to Ruth's text, and it takes away that compact, hermetic effect we have if she reads it, and she, we don't maybe understand because it's not understandable, but she makes, it, she makes us seem that we have to understand it. So it's that kind of comment also. I just uh, wanted to say that um, I think you made a, a great job and I, I understood really better than some points yesterday. So I think it was good. Really Thank great. you. <laughs> huh? Oh, no. Finally, I'm on. <laughs> uh, I wanted to say this uh, because people were talking before about uh, psychoanalytical aspects uh, or moments and we simply find here the idea of repetition and this repetition is actually only exemplifying or showing the idea of uh, multi perspectives it means all these voice or the difference between voice and voices that we've been talking about is exemplified by the fact that the same thing is being sh uh, represented here in different ways. First, we have the artwork, then we have a text springing out of thoughts of somebody about the artworks, which is very close narratively to the artwork itself. And then we have somebody reading the text, and by that, and I would object also to the idea uh, that it's not Lena's words. Of course it's Lena's words. Every author gives his thoughts or her thoughts uh, to other people, and by repeating them, they also interpret and make it their own uh, ideas and also express it by their own voice. I would like what? to say something about melody, actually, if it's my turn now. Uh, can you hear me? I, I can hear you, but you're speaking s fast. Ah, okay. There you. I would like to say something about melody. Because I think the point, what you pointed out when somebody is reading a speech that he prepared himself and he understands the content, in my experience that enables the speaker to perform with a certain rhetoric or a certain melodity, melody, I don't know exactly the word, and that melody can take me away from the content of the words sometimes. So in the beginning that really helped me to understand uh, the content much better because there was not that melody that could take me away. But then again, I'm, like the other speaker was pointing out, I got aware of your presence. And that, that then another kind of moment kicked in where I could get distracted because simply I started identifying with you standing there and making the mistake. So not because you made the mistake, or I'd be, not because I didn't understand the word, because you made a mistake, but that you made a mistake just made me aware of you standing there and having to do this and me listening, and then I also got distracted again. But in the first place, the absence of this rhetoric melody really helped me to deal with the content. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I would just say that Greek philosophy for the long time regarded speech as much higher as a text. Which is where it ties back into Mladendola, for those of you who've read it. And, but we, I've only read half of the book so far, so I can't really get into it. Maybe that also sort of just brings along like this thing that I was thinking about, that if, if a problem is that um, somehow the, the maker of the text would be too connected to the melody or the comple complexity of the words. Like, shouldn't, shouldn't if you want to um, mediate the content you have, should you even be reading from a text when you're standing on a stage like that? Like, live in front of an audience, like, why, why would you need the paper? Yeah, well, maybe Lauren Newton, the first, um, I don't know if you were here this morning, the clip I've, I, um, 
I played very much at the very beginning of the conference. Maybe she has an answer to that because she's actually producing meaning, and we all understand that she's talking as a child without any words. It's only through melody. With any, at least not any words that we can um, attach to a language we know. Do you, were you here in the morning? So not the morning. Shall we, is it possible that we play that again? She doesn't know where to find it. Um, Jort, are you here? Could you help us? Because it's, I think it's actually a very good example. Um, and we are already have this motif of the repetition, so it would be really fabulous. It's on the clip list. It's the first clip, but it's on uh, YouTube. So if we have access to internet, we can, we can hear it. Could you tell us in the meantime, what was your intention in showing a second time the film Emily? So I'm a bit obsessed by this second time, by this repetition. What do you think does it do to the film? To, sh it... to show Danica Dakish worked twice? Yes, with in between a quite large intermission. Um, I think, I mean, actually, to be honest, I, it's maybe because I trained as an art historian or maybe because I work w as a curator, I think it's really important to see artwork more than once. No, I agree. I agree with you, of course. <laughs> I wonder how that, and if, I agree with you as well, and usually the film is anyway showed in a loop, so the attention is actually there. I just wonder how much your text affects the second viewing. Yeah, and This is I actually mean, a bit, my, my question, is it a didactic or educational intention, or is it actually something else? Um, um, I, so I have done that before that I repeated works, but I've never done it like this with an interpretive text in between, and when I had, and thought about it in theory, I thought it, the second viewing would be informed by the reading. But as I was watching it now, that didn't ha even happen for me. To be very, very honest, it didn't happen for me. Because, because I w had still, I hadn't seen this work since I wrote the text, which was in 2010. So um, I actually, um, um, I actually still had, was very busy with taking in the film. So I was still very busy with taking stock and I never managed to get into this analytical mode of, of tying what I had written about the text back to the film. So it didn't really happen for me. I don't know it ha if it happened for you, but it didn't happen for me. question. Um, I don't know if I fantasized it, but the first time the video, I felt that the sound was behind me, and the second time that it was in front of me, and you spoke about how the artist has a surround sound. Did I, was that just my imagination, or? I think that might have either been a, fl a flaw of the technique, but I think here we only have two speakers, and maybe you were influenced so much by what I'd said the first time and forgotten in the second time. So actually the sound was coming from the front, but in, in its true projection, it's coming from the back. Well, actually, um, I had the same feeling, and I, I think what happened is that I found when you, when you mentioned that the sound should be different, um, I, I had... Um, the, I told myself that actually that wasn't necessary because the camera did that for you, that you had the feeling the woman was behind you. And only when you had explained everything, the second time with, I saw it, it was much flatter. The whole thing was, the distances were completely different. Um, is it possible to have that clip? No, I'm sorry, I'm just sitting in, I don't know which clip it is, and I don't know, is it on this computer? It's, yeah, and it's the first one in, on the clip list. Because then I have to call Eric, because I really don't, I have no clip list here. Do you have access to YouTube? What is the 
It's called Lauren Newton. That's um, Conversations Junior. Okay, so I wanted to, uh, I, sh I shouted my outburst earlier. I wanted to uh, check in with it um, before we play the clip. I was really interested because this seems to be this seems to be some kind of uh, attempt at a puncture uh, in terms of a rhetoric around voice or a kind of logo centric reading of a text. And I and I was kind of serious in relation to this idea of embarrassment as actually a really positive um, kind of affect somehow. And and I'm really quite liking the weird tension <laughs> now in relation to this discussion. Um, of somebody else speaking on your behalf. And I, I came in a little late. I'm presuming it's your daughter, is, am I completely wrong? I'm completely wrong, forget about it. It's me who's embarrassed now, that's terrible. Um, I'd love to <laughs> We saw some similarity, that's the thing, I don't know. But um, I quite like this, uh, I guess yesterday I was very aware that I, I still felt tied by the word somehow and, and tied by text, so I just wanted to say that I quite like this this moment of discussion where I wasn't sure what was going on, but that might have been because I came in a little late. So well, we had this subject of channeling, and it's, uh -huh. it's about also pupil-teacher uh, pupil relationship, sure. and there was a tie between the last film by May, where, where this um, uh, versionist, if Thai female versionist, like uh, who dubbing, became a star, right. um, goes through this ritual in order to prepare, prepare herself for the performance by praying to her teacher. Right. praying to an image of her teacher, a photograph of her teacher. And yeah. um, I think that reverberates in the, in the film by Danica and also reverberates in what we did here. Mm -hmm. But I was also, when you were saying, talking about the embarrassment, mm -hmm. there is an, and then you were assuming that we're mother-daughter, yeah. which I find very interesting as an idea. Yeah. I was reminded of a very embarrassing situation when my daughter was performing on stage. Um, as this as a young girl, maybe 10 years old, maybe 12 years old, with a kind of a modern dance group. And it wasn't any professional thing. It was just that she was taking a modern dance class. And as part of that class, they made a performance and all the parents come. And they pay a lot of money to get in because it supports the school. And, you know, it's just very, anyone who has kids and has them at school knows the situation, yeah? And then there are some people like Nina who are performing with a professional attitude and who are, um, who are doing this as a vocation, but often children are in the situation where they're performing because the institution around them, the educational institution, thinks this is a good idea. And so they're performing in this role. And this was the case with my daughter, who loved her class, but was really bad at it. And um, she really loved dancing there, but she looked like an elephant. And what happened that uh, for to me was that I was sitting elephant. in the audience and willing her to be gracious. And she wasn't. And I was physically, I found myself and it was so embarrassing to myself that I was doing this, that I was projecting on her. I found myself moving my body as she's dancing, as if I was a puppet master and by moving my body I could make her body move the way I wanted her to move. And then I caught myself at it and I couldn't stop it even though I caught myself at it. That was an embarrassing situation. <laughs> I'm a recent father so maybe that's why I checked in with the... Um... <laughs> God, I hope my kid can dance. So now we have um, we have Lauren Newton again.
Thank you so much for finding that for us. Um, um, so this is an example where, at least in part, there's meaning making without, um, through melody, without words. But in part, it's music. And the meaning, it's a meaning of music. So it's an, actually, when you listen to it closely, there's, it's an, at least a tension in that. Yeah, and was, as it was playing, and this was very different from the first time because you're all already tired and you're in need of a break, a lot of people were whispering. And I think that's also really interesting because as, as one's sitting, I've, had, I've been a teacher for a long time, but I've also been a lecturer and I've been in this situation often. And um, there's always something very disturbing going for one if one's sitting here and people start um, whispering because of course you think they're not concentrating on what you're trying to tell them, you know, they're not concentrating here, they're dissatisfied somehow or it's just an effect of being tired but as I'm thinking about all this it's also a very interesting and beautiful way of meaning, you know, constructing this thing. Maybe the whisper should also be taken serious and now I'm taking it serious as a sign that you need a break. So uh, we will have a break now and we will start again at five o'clock sharp. <laughs>